All right, welcome. In this video, we're going to talk through some practice problems involving solutions and IMFs and solubility and conductivity. So as we see a problem, if you have not yet tried these, I recommend that you pause the video and think about it and try and answer it on your own and then hit play again once you are ready to check your work. Okay, so make sure you pause and think about it before you listen to me talk through the answers. All right, so this first one, we're looking at which of these solutions do we expect to conduct electrical current? So in general, what we are looking for here, the general principle, is that ionic compounds will be electrolytes. So when they dissolve in water, they will split apart and form ions. And then typically covalent compounds are going to be non-electrolytes, which means they will not conduct. The exception here is going to be acids. Acids are covalent compounds that are electrolytes. And we are just going to avoid acids for now. <laughs> so none of these examples are acids. Uh, we're going to talk more about acids in second semester. So you just want to look for it. Is it ionic or covalent? So this first one here, it's a metal and non-metal. It's ionic. So it will conduct. Um, same with C. It is also ionic. It will conduct. If you look at B and D, these are both molecular covalent. So I'd expect them to, you know, not conduct. Um, not. Okay. <laughs> and next thing we want to do is we want to be able to accurately draw particle representations of solutions and particularly with ionic compounds. So sodium nitrate is an ionic compound. So if we're trying to draw what happens when this ionic compound dissolves in water, we want to first show that it will split apart into ions. So my drawing should show a sodium ion, a nitrate ion. I should have the charges labeled appropriately. So sodium's plus one, nitrate's minus two. And the question tells me to draw two formula units. Um, that is, that means two sodiums and two nitrates. And we use the word formula unit rather than molecule. So if we have molecular covalent bonding, we refer to them as molecules. If we have ionic bonding, we refer to them as formula units. So we cannot use the word molecule with something that's ionic because there's no such thing as a molecule if you're an ionic compound. So we just call them formula units. And then we want to show what's happening. So first thing we want to show that they're split apart into ions. And then we also want to show how the water molecules are interacting with these ions. And water molecules are polar. The oxygen atom is more electronegative than the hydrogen atoms. So that means the electrons are going to be pulled towards the oxygen side of the molecule. So this side ends up with a partial negative charge. This side ends up with a partial positive charge. So what that means is when your water molecules um, get near an ion, the negative side of water is going to attract the positive ions. And the positive side of water is going to attract those negative ions. So you want to be able to accurately represent this, what we call an ion dipole attraction. It didn't ask us for the IMF, I'm just adding that in there. And this is what it would look like. So you might be asked to draw a structure like this, or you might be asked, be given several different representations and be asked which one is correct. So you want to be able to kind of see what's, visualize what's going on here at a particle level. You may have heard the saying that like dissolves like. It's a general pattern that we might notice that polar tends to dissolve in polar, nonpolar tends to dissolve in nonpolar, but if you mix polar and nonpolar together, they don't dissolve. And that's a useful pattern to notice, um, but it is, does not work as an explanation. So I just wanted to let you know, if someone asks you, you know, sugar dissolves in water, explain why. If you say because like dissolves like, that will earn you zero points. Okay, so we want to explain why we see this pattern based on the intermolecular forces. So let's look at, and these are the intermolecular forces that you might observe in solutions, right? Dispersion, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, ion dipole. So let's, uh, and when we think about the impact of these 
forces on solution formation, in order for a solution to form, these solvent-solute interactions need to be sufficiently strong. And the stronger the attraction between the solvent and the solute, the more likely a solution will form. So if we have a comparative question, you know, how come this substance dissolves in water and this one does not, it's going to have to do with the relative attraction of the substance to the water. So we want to make sure we're focusing on that solvent-solute interaction if we're explaining um, an observation. So here's an example. So we are told that NH3 is more soluble in water than pH3, and we want to explain why. And this question asks us to also draw a particle representation. So we're kind of doing a two for one here. We're thinking about the IMFs and we're thinking about what this particle representation would look like. So let me draw them both out. So pH3 and NH3 have very similar structures. They're both um, trigonal pyramidal here in shape. So they're both polar. Um, the, but if we compare these, so here we've got an H covalently bonded to an ONRF, and then we've got an ONRF right here. So that means this right here is a hydrogen bond. So this is a hydrogen bond intermolecular force. And same thing over here, we've got an H covalently bonded to an ONRF, and then we've got an ONRF in a nearby molecule. So that's a hydrogen bond. Over here, this hydrogen is capable of hydrogen bonding, but this is a phosphorus. It's not an O, N, or an F. So this is not a hydrogen bond, but it's still polar. So it's a dipole, dipole force. And same thing down here. So this hydrogen is not capable of hydrogen bonding because it's bonded to a phosphorus rather than an N or F. So that's a dipole, dipole IMF. And the what we observe is that NH3 is more soluble um, than the pH3 in water. And when we're explaining this, what we want to say is we want to make sure we address the solvent-solute interaction. So we would say that the hydrogen bonding between NH3 and water is stronger than the dipole-dipole forces between pH3 and water. It's really important in your explanation that you make it clear that you're like you acknowledge that you're talking about the attraction between the substance and the water. Like if you just write um, it's because NH3 can hydrogen bond and that's all you write, that is not sufficient because you're not addressing what's really important, which is the attraction between NH3 and the water. So you want to acknowledge that it can hydrogen bond with water, and you also want to compare it to what pH3 can do. So make sure if you're comparing things, you have to discuss both situations in your answer. So discuss, you say, so what you could say is because NH3 can hydrogen bond with water, and that's stronger than pH3's dipole-dipole attractions to water. Okay, problems four and five are just kind of straightforward, um, not involving explaining, just predicting what's a good solvent for this scenario. So if a substance is nonpolar, like these two, um, a good solvent would be anything over here in this category. So this is where we're just kind of applying this like dissolves like rule is probably the simplest way to approach a problem like this. So nonpolar substances will dissolve well in nonpolar solvents. Your polar and ionic ones are going to dissolve well in your um, polar solvents right here. Uh, so that's kind of the main takeaway behind this question. So like you, you could, for example, say water would be a good one for B and D, um, and hexane would be a good one for A and C. You could also choose something else from the list would also work too. And then this one, we are, for the molecule, you want to predict whether it would dissolve better in water or in hexane. So hexane looks like this. It looks really symmetric all the way around, so it is nonpolar. Um, this is what water looks like. It is polar. So what you would do is you would look at your, at your molecules here, and you'd ask yourself, is it polar or not? So glucose has a bunch of these like OH bonds around it all over the place. So this looks pretty polar and it looks like it's capable of hydrogen bonding. So it's going to dissolve well in water versus naphthalene. Notice how it's like C's and H's all the way around. It looks very symmetric. This is pretty nonpolar. 
and so it's going to dissolve better in hexane. So the, again, questions four and five, these don't require um, explanation. This is maybe more something you'd seen a multiple choice question, just what does it dissolve best in? Yeah. So let's look at another one that's last one. This is another explaining one. So if you look at the structures of vitamin A and vitamin C, one of these vitamins is water soluble and uh, one is not. One is actually fat soluble. And so you want to identify which is which based on the structure. Keep in mind that water is polar, fat is pretty nonpolar. So if you take a look at these structures, you'll notice that vitamin C has a bunch of OH bonds. It looks really polar and it's able to hydrogen bond with water. So vitamin C is pretty water soluble because it can do all its hydrogen bonding, it's polar, so it dissolves well in water. In vitamin A, if you look at this molecule, notice how it's mainly C's and H's. So if you're gonna draw this out, this all looks pretty symmetric. So this whole part of the molecule over here is pretty nonpolar. There is one little bit off here to the side. There's a little one H bonded to an O, so that little part of it's able, capable of hydrogen bonding, but it's mostly nonpolar. So it overall vitamin A is nonpolar, mostly nonpolar, um, and it's soluble in fat instead of water. So that's an application of your solubility there. Okay, so thanks for watching. I think that's our last one. Yep, and uh, let me know if you have questions. Questions.